Okay, so now let's talk about A of CIs and, and, and what's its intended purpose. A of CIs are intended to protect during an arcing event for two types of arcing events, and they're called combination A of CIs because there's two things. One is a parallel fault. So visualize two wires on a cord, and somehow the two wires got smushed together in the dielectric between the insulation of the two wires on a cord. The, on a leg of a lamp or something like that, it pushed it down and it pushed it down and, it, and then all of a sudden the separation of the insulation diminishes to the point that there's leakage between the two wires and as the voltage goes near the peak voltage, um, there's like a little enough voltage to kind of arc across that dielectric and then kind of like almost like a nonlinear load. As you get near the voltage, it, it kind of closed. Well, it kind of arced there and then it kind of goes back down. So now you're having an arcing taking place near the peak. But because the arcing is only happening near the peak voltage, uh, the current is going to be high because it's happening when you're at the peak voltage, but it's going to be a short duration. So we mentioned this lightly back when we talked about effective current. We said it was the RMS, Tom. I mean, I'm sorry, not Tom. Uh, Eric, we said it was the RMS current, and you said, well, Mike, it's the square of the instant values. You derive the mean, and then you get the root of that, and it's actually an SMR, <laughs> which was fine. And for a nonlinear load, a true RMS meter, we mentioned about the true RMS meter, that it had to get all those instant values squared, get a mean, and then get the root of that. That was fine. But when we start getting an arcing fault, and that fault only takes place near the peak, well, heat is a function of I squared R, and since it's near the peak, it's going to be a lot of heat. But because the duration is so short that if we took the RMS value of that arcing fault that has to be over 75 amperes peak, then maybe that's only like 3 or 4 amps of actual RMS current. Well, 15 amp breaker, everything is fine, but there is taking place heat. That's, that's called a parallel arcing fault. And then you have another characteristic is called a series arcing fault because we said called combination AFCIs. So the series arcing fault is like, well, you had a cord and it, you know, because you used it all the time, it kind of like got frayed and it may be open, but it's kind of close enough enough, close the, the uh, strands might be close enough enough that if you actually carried a current, you had a load, that it could kind of arc across that point but the current is not going to be high, and it's arcing, but GFCIs don't sense that because current goes out and comes back. Uh, no device is going to pick that up. So now there are causes of fires because of those two type of events, and that's what an AFCI is looking for. It's looking for a parallel arc, let's say a hot to neutral, dielectric, arcing near peak. It's looking for a series where a wire is kind of frayed and maybe kind of broken, but you have to carry current on the series and it has to be 5 amps or more because that's what the AFCI is looking for. So now, it said here that it's looking for characteristics of a waveform that reflects an arcing fault. That would have to do with the parallel because it kind of, it's going to look differently. And what they did was they sat down, the manufacturers did, and they took, they snapped waveforms. Pictures of, okay, what about the light bulb burns? What about the motor stars? What about this, uh, uh, this happening? And all these different waveforms, they, they snapped all these pictures and they put it in the computer. And in the computer, they're looking for a waveform. So a waveform goes up, it has to be more than 75 amperes peak. If it's not more than 75 amperes, we don't care about it. Hey, that one was more than 75 amperes. Okay, got it. Take snapshot that, half of a waveform. Go look in your computer. Is any of these, is, did this happen and match anything that looks like an arcing fault? Uh, yes, it does. Okay, then count it. One. And Tom, you correct me as I, as I go through here. So we're, we count that one as an arcing fault. And then it looks for the other half waveform, and it keeps looking for waveforms that are more than 75 amperes that have a characteristic waveform that matches what we think is going to be an arcing fault. And it starts adding up these counts. And I'm going to say something, and I might be wrong, that if you get so many of these events taking place in sequential order, bum, 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 I, I, I don't remember how many times it takes for, in sequential order before it will then say, you know what, we have a problem, Houston. Gather computer, say, turn off this breaker. 
The other one is like, well, it didn't all go sequentially, and it kind of like skipped every once in a while. And I believe in the last 30 half cycles, if there were nine of those that happened, or what, nine? Like, why would it go over 75 amperes peak and have a characteristic of an arcing fault? And then it, the computer determines, you know, what we think is not right, and we're going we're gonna to open it up. Tom, how close am I? Do you know about You're those? close. Close enough. I mean, it, 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 the, the AFCI looks for abnormal arcing faults. And the challenge is to recognize the arcing fault but not trip on something that's a good arc because there are a lot of arcs that will occur inside of normally operating equipment. You know, we talked about them in the motor, all that good stuff. So, um, but you're, in essence, you're... you're uh, so looking at our graphic here is like maybe something could happen and there could be a parallel arcing fault and it's abnormal. It's, we're not quite sure what it is, okay? Then um, the sine wave. The current in arcing fault is limited by the system. Okay, we're talking about the current of the arcing fault. It's limited by the impedance of the circuit itself and the arc itself. At receptacles, fault current will be above 75 amperes, but not likely above 450 amperes of short circuit current. Because this device is looking for 75 amperes peak current or more. So if you have loads that are never going to be over 75 amperes, which is probably most cases on 15 and 20 ampere circuits, then pretty much eliminates everything. But in the event of an arcing fault, well, probably the short circuit study that we did all the way down at the end, you know, it should be more than 75 amperes. So this is an example of an arcing fault waveform. They're like, yeah, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, boom, it's off. And I, I think I got this from Cutler Hammer like phew, probably 20 something years ago. Uh, and, and what it looked like. So that's what it's doing. Parallel arcing faults. Series arcing fault event. That occurs when the wire within the cord is unintentionally broken. I'm not sure if we will keep wanting to use the word unintentionally. We watch and search for that. Causing the current to arc across the gap in a wire. Let me see if I have a picture. No, I didn't have a picture. <laughs> I don't have a picture. Maybe, Tom, you have a picture of a cord and somebody, hey, look right there. Oh, you, can, you know, yeah. you know I, I don't have a picture showing that. And that's the cord. That's a series arcing fault. So these are called combination AFCIs. Um, and the reason they're called combination because they're looking for both the parallel and they're also looking for the series. There are devices that are not looking for one or the other, um, but we're not going to get into that kind of stuff because it really is not relevant. Mario, what is the code rule that talks about AFCIs? Sure. Uh, we mentioned GFCIs. So I think we mentioned, maybe we didn't, 210.8 is a GFCI rules. And yeah. the AFCI rules of National Inter Code. The AFCI rules, Mark, are in 210.12. And it tells you now we need AFCI protection for dwelling units, units. Uh, for um, uh, guest rooms and guest, guest suites. Guest rooms, dormitories, Stories. guest suites. Uh, you know, there are other, in other words, anytime people are sleeping. See, AFCI um, started with the concept that you want to put them in places where people are sleeping because studies have shown more people die in, in homes because it's dwelling unit rules. These are not commercial. Well, they're, I can't say dwelling units. They're places where people sleep in, you know, uh, where that's where people have a tendency to die. Well, because people are sleeping. So more than likely, that's where they're going to die. So not because there's more arcing events that take place in where people sleep. It's just that their people are there longer periods of time and a higher likelihood of them being injured. There are no AFCI protection requirements for commercial, but they are as per um, one, a uh, 210.12 for dormitories, um, hotels, motels. Limited care facilities. You know, health care facilities where people are sleeping, you know, let's provide that protection there. That's a technology. It's different than a GFCI. Hey, Mike, can I have a GFCI on the same circuit with an AFCI breaker, GFCI receptacle? Tom, is there, is there a problem with me having, is there an incompatibility with a GFCI receptacle on a AFCI protective circuit? They do two different things. There's no compatibility issues whatsoever. Exactly right. Yeah. If, if you know what a GFCI is, it's measuring the imbalance, right? Okay. Well, if you understand what an AFCI is, it's looking for waveform characteristics that reflect arcing faults or series arcing faults. There is no incompatibility at all. So if somebody says, well, you can't put it, you can't, what about, oh, Tom, what about if I put a GFCI receptacle on a GFCI protected circuit? Is there an incompatibility there? No. No. 
<laughs> no, it, it, they, so I don't want you thinking that GFCIs on G, not that you put it, well, you might put a GFCI on a GFCI protective circuit. That's fine. You already had it once. You don't need it twice. You know where that comes up in, in, in discussion is, especially on panel two, remember, there, on, in, from a National Electrical Code perspective, there's requirements for appliances to have GFCI protection. There's requirements for GFCI protection in the home run, sir, in, in, in the infrastructure. And, and there seems to be this concern that what if I have GFCI on my, my Coke machine or my, my appliance and it's in the cord. And then I also, I plug it into a receptacle in my kitchen or in my garage and it's protected by a GFCI. You know, it's a bad thing. Well, no, one of them or both of them will trip if you have a ground fault. So there's not an issue with that at all. Well, and, and there's another scenario that <clears throat> service guys run into all the time is you come out to do whatever you're gonna do and there is a receptacle or two or three already installed. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, yeah, but I have to work on this and now I'm actually required to GFCI protect everything. You got a couple options. Number one, you can go take out all the receptacles. You could do that. Or you can just slap a GFCI breaker at the panel, which is gonna be a lot easier to deal with for you and do whatever you're gonna do. Now the whole circuit's protected. And, and I can just tell you from years of doing that, it's an easier solution, number one. And number two, we never had issues with, oh, man, there's four GFIs already on this circuit that we just put a GFI breaker. Four GFIs on the circuit were not a problem. So, so, so here's, I, this is a real, real thing. I walked, I went to a, a person's house. I go into the garage, okay, because he's working in the garage. I come walking in the garage, and I'm looking at the receptacles, which, again, a nice garage. And every receptacle <laughs> was a GFCI. Yep. Yeah. And then I, I go into the kitchen, Every receptacle is a GFCI. Whoever wired his home did not understand that you don't have to put every receptacle because the first one protects nope. the remainder of them. That probably wasn't what it was. Oh, it's exactly what it was. Yeah, okay. no, we, because I, we've <laughs> had customers actually request right. that we put individual GFCIs. No, that wasn't the case in this one. Yeah, okay. I was going to say. I pressed the one GFCI and they, they all, all went out. <laughs> <laughs> And I went okay. into the kitchen, I pressed the one GSI okay. and they all went out. And oh, like, wow. Okay, that's, this is ungood. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I guess it's, it's not ungood. It's expensive. It's not a big, it's, it's expensive. Yeah, yeah. that's all. But, well, and then well, he people, got People he, think when the National Electric Code says that you have to have these receptacles GFCI right. protected, right. some people don't understand. Well, if you put the GFCI in the beginning of the circuit, like the first receptacle, and put a GFCI receptacle, Downstream is protected. If you put it at the circuit breaker, downstream is going to be protected. Right? Mike, just a quick point back to AFCIs, and this is just from personal experience. We haven't really mentioned this, but AFCI testers. I've had horrible experiences with AFCI tester, and I just found out now why. I'm reading the, the UL category guide, and if, if you are having problems with AFCI tester, it's because these testers can't really make an arcing fault. They kind of mimic mm -hmm. an arcing True. fault. So the guide tells you, hey, if it doesn't work, go back to the actual AFCI device and press that test button. And if it, it that's the way you can check it's properly Absolutely. functioning. And, and I was, and I started, I think I said it, hey, I don't cover the test button, but you have to press, same thing on a GFCI, right. to test it, you have to press the test button. You don't take a thing at the end of the thing. Right. And, and work it that way, for, same thing with AFCIs. You know, for us gadget guys there for a while, they came out with some really cool GFCI testers. Yeah, they, they tell you cool. the impedance of the, oh, yeah. of the yeah. equipment grounding Kinda conductor cool. and yeah. how many milliamps it tripped at, and that was really cool. And I lost mine for whatever reason. I can't remember moving or whatever. And I went to go buy another one. I couldn't find one. And so yeah. I called up the rep. He's like, yeah. oh, yeah, we don't sell those anymore because... They were changing algorithms, because mine was AFCI, GFCI. Yeah. They were changing the algorithms on the breaker so fast, we couldn't keep up with them. We couldn't make it trip uh, every time we thought we yeah. had something. And, the, and there was an issue. The, the, that handheld tester is listed to one UL standard. Uh, the AFCIs are listed to another UL standard. And, they're, and, and you know, AFC, AFCIs are no two arcs. It's like lightning. Right. No two arcs are the That's same. Right. Right, so they're like snowflakes, right? So, so if I'm trying to, if I'm trying to recognize an arcing fault, and I change my algorithm, yeah, all of a sudden, what was an arc that you were generating is no longer recognized because I changed my algorithm. So, so I think if you guys are like, I don't know what these guys are talking about anymore. These guys are having a good old time. I can see, and they're right by. What you're saying is this: the way that you test to validate that the GFCI device is proper. 
is that you're going to press the test button. The way you validate that an AFCI is proper is you test the test button. Sure. If you're trying to determine whether or not uh, something is connected to the GFCI protected circuit, well, you can take a little device and you plug it in. But there's some problems with that, and we'll talk about that later on. The last thing I want to say about GFCI is my personal experience, and you guys might have had this experience, and I've had this where I've seen it on, uh, on social media, and I've given guys the solution. Hey, Mike, I'm having my GFCI breaker trip. And this happened to me, brand new house uh, in, in Florida, and I try to turn the lights, boom, it tripped. Uh, now, this is like a pretty b big RV garage, lights are way up there, everything is all done, and it's like, okay, how am I going to find out where in this building of all the lighting elevated, where it has tripped? And it's like, you got to be kidding me. And I thought, you know what? I wonder if these receptacles are on that light circuit. And I found out, well, when it tripped, I, it, it, there was a receptacle. I went to the, first, I went to the receptacle that was closest, because it was GFC, I protected, that was closest to the light. Okay, I, I, and I put, no, I put the first receptacle. I made it a GFC, I protected receptacle. Then I changed the breaker to a regular breaker. Then I turn on the light, and it works perfectly. I don't know why. So if you're in the field and the breaker is tripping, what you can do is say, you know what? Let me try changing it to a receptacle, and let me see if that works. Tom, have you heard this at all? Uh, I've not heard that. <clears throat> Depending on what's on that circuit, sure, sure. if there's leakage current somewhere else in that circuit behind you somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, you know, upstream. Because remember, a GFCI only looks downstream. You you can have a GFCI on that receptacle, and if there was a problem in between the receptacle and the circuit breaker, you can still get killed because the circuit breaker is no longer protecting you. Because what you did was you moved the protection from one part of the circuit to another part of the circuit, which could be on the other side of where the actual fault was. But 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 this is just something that I think the GFCIs and receptacles are slightly different no. in some technology than they are in, in breakers. In, in because fact, this was only like about 10 feet. It was just panel to the first receptacle, took the breaker off, put a regular recept break receptacle, I mean breaker, and I just changed the first receptacle. I, I have heard fine. of the same problem. I have heard of the same problem. Yeah. So there's I'm something there, Tom. Well. Yeah. All right, I'm done. Uh, with those type of protection devices.